Parenting is a pretty tough job. We kind of learn as we go, don't we? Making a uh, number of mistakes along the way. At least, at least for me, that's been true. We're going to get some helpful advice today, though, from Dr. Patricia Batten. She's the mother of three sons and also is a ranked adjunct assistant professor of preaching at Gordon-Conwell Theological Seminary and the author of Parenting by Faith, What Jesus Said to Parents. And that's available online at patbatten.com. So uh, good to have you with us, uh, Pat. Oh, it's good to be here. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, looking forward to the conversation here. I mean, I'm 55 now, uh, and I still need all the advice I can possibly get on parenting. I still have kids at home. We've, we've got a, a big boatload of kids. And uh, so can you, first of all, just uh, give us a brief overview of your book? Sure. So the book, like you said, is Parenting by Faith, What Jesus Said to Parents. And it truly is what Jesus said to parents. I went through a little bit of a difficult time. Uh, with a couple of my sons at the same time, and I really delved into scripture and uh, just felt desperate and said, Lord, what do you have to say to me as a mom? Because I don't know what to do. I, I really, I'm at my wit's end here. <laughs> I'm, uh, you know, my husband and I have tried many different approaches. We, we really don't know what to do. And I was surprised. I just read through the gospels to see how many times Jesus interacted with parents and really mothers he interacted with and fathers he interacted with. And those conversations became incredibly instructive for me as a mother. Uh, Jesus did not give a list of how to's, this is what you need to do, or, you know, five lessons, that kind of thing. But uh, just seeing his interaction with these parents helped me to see him better and I think how much he he values uh, parents and really what, what we do here on earth. So that's what the book is about. It's really a digging into scripture. Well, you know what? That's never going to hurt you. That's for sure. I mean, you know, I, I know people who have chosen not to have any kids because it's, you know, such a, a scary world today, right? It seems like it anyhow. So uh, talk a little bit about uh, some of the biggest fears we have as parents today. You touch on that in the book. Sure. So, yeah, there are a lot of fears. Uh, I, the first thing that comes to mind is uh, the smartphones. Uh, it's a big one. And what are my kids doing? Who are they talking to? What's their conversation like? That kind of thing. Uh, we fear for all kinds of things. And it depends season to season. When we've got little kids, we fear for their falls. Uh, you know, all three of my kids have uh, fallen down our steps. One of them <laughs> rode his bike off the retaining wall. <laughs> and, you know, by the third, you're just like, are you okay? <laughs> uh, you know, I think every one of our kids has fallen down the stairs. <laughs> you think we'd, I, you know, but on the other hand, you know, if they never fall, it's interesting to, to think about that. It would be weird going through life never having fallen. Yeah. I can't admit, I mean, I've fallen down the same steps too. So, <laughs> yeah, but every season has, I think it comes uh, with it a different fear. And as the kids begin to grow older into the preteen, teen year and even beyond, it's what are they going to do with their lives? You know, are they going to make it God? Are they going to stay close to you? Are they ever going to find you? Are they going to find companionship? Will they have friends? Will they succeed? What does that look like? And it's just this, I mean, you could worry constantly. Yeah, oh, yeah. Yeah, there's lots of this. Long, long list. You know, is it just me, uh, Pat, or do parents often struggle with comparisons? You know, we worry that our kids aren't measuring up with the neighbors and uh, other people at, uh, you know, church or school. And perhaps we worry that, to be honest, it reflects badly on us as parents. I think that's part of it, too, isn't it? Oh, I think so. Yeah. So that's uh, social comparison. And that's how we that's how we figure out how we are doing, uh, not just with our kids, but, you know, how, how are we doing? You know, should am I supposed to be dressing this way? Am I supposed to be sounding this way? Do I have the right credentials? We look at other people. Uh, so it makes sense. But we do it with our kids as well. And I remember I had a mentor tell me once, you know, if, if you're going to play this game, this comparison game and you you want to cherry pick what you want from uh, other people's children or their marriage or whatever it is. He said, you, you got to take everything, take everything, take the difficult marriage with it. You've got to take the diagnosis with it. But of course we all want to cherry pick and make the perfect product. 
But life doesn't work that way. God has given us what he's given us. And it's our job to turn to him and, and trust him with that and ask for his help. I like the way you, yeah, you, you, you point that out there. Again, your mentor saying, hey, you can't cherry pick because that's what we do, isn't it? You're, you're, I think you're bang <laughs> we on. <do. laughs> you, know, you know, we do. You know, we tend to worry as parents that our kids may not turn out as we had hoped. Like you mentioned that earlier. And, and we, we pray for certain things, right? Or that they may, uh, I mean, I mean, we, we have fears that they may get shot at school in the crazy world we live in today too, right? Oh, yeah. But yeah. the title of your book states Parenting by Faith. Now, that's obviously easier said than done. But uh, do you want to expound yeah. on that a bit? Uh, you know, how, where, where do we come up with this? magical faith. Sure. Yeah, right. This magical faith. So when you look at these interactions in scripture, you see that these parents come to Jesus and they truly are desperate. Uh, they don't come to him, you know, six months in advance of an issue or a problem. They're desperate. They come running to him. My daughter is about to die. My son is uh, demon possessed. And I've been, you know, talking to all of these people for, you know, years or a decade. And Jesus really tests each parent. And that's what surprised me, I, I think. I don't know if I was looking for a magical formula when I, when I read through the New Testament, you know, looking specifically for this. But what Jesus does with parents is absolutely stunning. He, he pushes them. Um, I think of the Canaanite woman in Matthew 15. So uh, Jesus is walking through her neighborhood. She is not a Jewish person. And she comes running to him. She's the woman who says, Lord, have mercy on me. My daughter is suffering terribly. And I love that she says as a mom, have mercy on me. She doesn't say have mercy on my daughter. She says, have mercy on me. What parent, uh, you know, has not felt that when they are uh, feeling for their child uh, that they, they're the ones who need the mercy. The parents need the mercy as well. And he really pushes this woman uh, to her limit. He, he really tests her faith to the point where you think, Lord, why are you saying this to her? Um, it's, this is not my Sunday school Jesus. But Jesus wants to see what her faith is made out of. And ultimately, he wants to grow her in her faith. And I think if we have that perspective as parents, saying that every challenge we face with our child, okay, yeah, God is doing something with our kids, but he's doing something with us as parents. And to see that as a test and to see it as an opportunity for growth. And I think that strong faith really does stick with Jesus in those moments. I mean, I think of that woman, yeah, so many who could have stormed off mad or angry or said, get you, Jesus. But he says, stick with me, stick with me, and, and something's going to happen here. Yeah. Well, often he'll point out even you know, to, uh, again, somebody who's not Jewish, and of course, you know, in that context, in that, 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 that time, uh, I mean, wow, he says, you know, wow, great is your faith. I haven't seen faith that great, you know, in, in Israel, all those kinds of statements, right, that come out often. Uh, you know, I, yeah, thank you for bringing that up. I mean, it's like he's a... Uh, a good coach. You know what? Sometimes coaches do some, they push you and you're thinking, man, what a nasty guy. But you know, you're really thankful later on when you win the medal. You go like, you know, he was right. Hmm. Right. And you don't realize it till later, maybe, oh, that's yeah. what he was yeah. doing. But you're right. He does. He tells her she has great faith. And I think it's interesting because in that situation, the apostles, the disciples are surrounding them. And of course, they're the ones who said, send her away, send her away. And Peter's standing in the crowd, and in the chapter before, we see Jesus uh, walking on water, coming out to his disciples, and Peter getting out of the boat, looking at him, then sinking. And what Jesus says to Peter is, you of little faith, why did you doubt? So he calls his, I like to say his big dog disciple, uh, <laughs> the man with little faith, <laughs> and this outsider woman, great faith. Oh, that's a fascinating comparison. Oh, thanks for sharing that. You know, you point out, Patricia, in the, uh, uh, that, that sometimes the goals we have for our own kids might not actually be in sync with the goals God has for our kids. That's an interesting um, thought to, to ponder. Yeah, it, it really is. And that starts from the very beginning, too. I mean, as soon as these kids enter, enter school, you're talking maybe they're three years old or maybe even before that. 
uh, we do. We start looking around and we think, okay, so this is what our kids should be doing. Uh, these are the goals we should have for them. They need to make the team. They need to be in the club. They need to be the best this, the best that. And we find them just the right teachers and coaches and all of that. And uh, you look at this passage with James and John and their mother, and she approaches Jesus and says, you know, let my kids sit at your right and your left when your kingdom comes. And she's thinking this physical kingdom, Jesus will be on a throne and her sons will have the most prominent positions. And he says to her, you do not know what you're asking. And I can't help but imagine that this mother must have replayed those words over and over again when Jesus was on the cross. And there she is, watch this scene, imagining her sons then and there at Jesus' right and his left. Oh, that is not where she yeah. wanted her son. Oh, boy. Yeah. And of course, she did not know what she was asking. And I think so often as parents, we're asking for, you know, the best for my son, the best for my daughter, you know, make, make this, make that. And Jesus says greatness in his kingdom is service. And how often do we pray as parents, Lord, make my son the best servant. Mm. <laughs> That's a good ever. prayer. Yeah, you know what? I think you're onto something there. It's a good prayer. Well, yeah. it's the eternal perspective, right? Because the least you know, here, you're going to be the greatest in, in, in heaven, right? I mean, so, yeah, well, that's, that's very interesting. You use an expression in the book, uh, a just-in-case God. Explain that. Yeah, so that's hedging your bets. So having God, but also having maybe this on the side, that on the side. When the Israelites were talking Old Testament time, uh, they didn't completely forsake God, but they added to him. So they worshiped idols just in case, you know, just in case God didn't work out. And I wonder if we do that as parents as well. Okay, I'll, I'll trust you, God, but just in case you don't work out, I mean, just in case this doesn't pan out the way I'd like it to for my child, my son, or my daughter, you know, I'm also going to turn to this uh, self-help or I'm going to turn someplace else, but fully trusting God with our kids. I mean, it's not easy. And that's what he says. He says, hey, I, I gave them to you. Trust me with them. Trust me entirely with them. Well, yeah, that's a good reminder. Again, easier said than done, my. Um, in, in the book, you, you talk about what Jesus said to his own earthly mother. So yes. <laughs> what can we learn from that? Yeah, so that's an interesting passage, too. So many of these passages, I, you really have to read a second time and you think, oh, Jesus, you said that? <laughs> Are yeah. you sure? And he addresses her in a bit of a strange way. And the NIV and some other translations uh, like to soften it. But he addresses her by saying, woman. So the NIV, I think you have dear woman, that kind of thing. It wasn't dear woman. It really was <laughs> woman. <laughs> And it's typically not the way uh, a son would address a mother at, at any age. It's not, you know, an endearing phrase. But what he is saying in this case, this is John chapter 2, his, uh, his first public miracle, is he's saying the relationship has changed. Or maybe not even changed, but there is a more important relationship mom <laughs> mm -hmm. that that I need to follow. And what I do here today and what I do every day has got to come uh, from my primary relationship with my heavenly father. And that, that phrase, that word woman, uh, really signals this, that Jesus, what he does, come, it, it, everything he does comes from his heavenly father. And I started thinking about that as our kids grow older. You know, when they're little, mama, mama, da, 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 yeah, da, yeah. you know, at the point where I am with my kids right now, it's it's pretty much, hey, ma, <laughs> that didn't take long to get there, but hey, ma, and you, know, you see them growing and they're, uh, you know, they're listening to other people a little bit more than they're listening to me at this mm. point. Mm -hmm. And as a parent, that's hard to watch. Uh, where their influence comes from. 
But I think that's something that is supposed to happen. We need to guard that and watch that carefully. But Jesus was saying something very similar to his mother, that his priorities, his agenda came from his heavenly father. And ultimately, that's how we're raising our kids, for their priorities, their agenda to come come from God. We cannot tell them what to do all the time. Any final thoughts here? Uh, I'm, I'm running out of time, but you know, what, what do you say to parents who have messed up? And just briefly, but and, and then you know, thinking, thinking to themselves, I mean, pff, it's too late for our kids at this point. Uh, you know, that's it's a bad feeling, but it is a bad feeling, and I think we've all been there. Yeah, we say it's too, it's too late for me, God. It's never too late, ever too late. Keep lifting your kids up to God in prayer, and know that He cares, He listens, and He really does have a heart for parents at every single stage. And uh, don't believe me, dig into the scriptures, look at the book and uh, hear them speak for, your, for yourself. Oh, very good. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Batten, appreciate it. It was so good to be with you. Thanks for having me. Yeah, likewise, Dr. Patricia Batten, author of Parenting by Faith, What Jesus Said to Parents. You can get that online at patbatten.com. On behalf of all of us at Bridge City News, thank you so much for watching today.